How's it going, guys? My name is Zach with The Movie Castle, and today we're going to be taking a look at Deserter from the Junji Ito Story Collection. This is a collection of 12 anthology stories from Japanese horror manga legend Junji Ito. And I do have to say, this is a really good, interesting collection of his work, uh, because this one uh, kind of has a unifying theme, and that is, these are primarily uh, earlier stories. Now, I really wish there was more notes with this book. I don't know if these are, like, his earliest stories in chronological order or what. I know one's missing because uh, I believe the first story he ever uh, completed was the first chapter of Tomie. That's obviously in the Tomie collection instead. Uh, but you can tell that these are earlier. And the very first story, Biohouse, an interesting story with a big fun finale. But you can tell the art's a little earlier, a little less developed. Junji Ito, obviously known for his amazing, crazy artwork. And by the time you get to the final story in here, Deserter, you can see that the art has come a long way, and you can see it getting better over the chapters. And yeah, that is really interesting to see the art and the story improvement, uh, but also, yeah, the stories. Some interesting stuff. Some stories in here are more psychological, and they may or may not have a supernatural twist, and they may or may not have a Junji Ito visual at the end. Uh, stories like The Devil's Logic, Scripted Love, A Father's Love, and Bullied. More psychological stories than, uh, you know, body horror stories. And you do get to see, like, with Where the Sandman Lives, which is like the third story in here, a really good, creepy example of Junji Ito body horror really, really early. And we do get to see him experimenting and become more and more what he's known for. Another story in here, The Reanimator's Sword. I really wish there were notes here, but Reanimator's Sword really does feel like a pitch for a series. And I could see an alternate timeline where rather than these short story collections, I could totally see Junji Ito just doing like 43 volumes of Reanimator's Sword because... So many other manga artists, they get a long-running series and they stick with that for a long, long time. And why that would have been interesting, I really am glad Junji Ito didn't go down this path. And I, I like the anthology horror much better. So it is interesting to see Junji Ito get on his feet and see some of his earlier stuff. And there is really good stories in here really good ideas and definitely a few things you'll be thinking about a long time later. And there's uh, a few of my favorites. I'd have to say my favorite from this book is Village of the Siren, where some people come back to their hometown and find this mysterious factory with a big siren that blares every single night and has some strange control over the residents. It, that's really fun. And then also, Where the Sandman Lives, like I said, a good visual. And same with Long Hair in the Attic. That one is just crazy, too. I, I love the, the reveal at the end of that one. And a lot of the other ones, like Scripted Love or A Father's Love, maybe not the most terrifying visuals, but interesting concepts you'll be thinking about for a while. I do want to also say... Uh, Netflix put out a new anime for Junji Ito, Junji Ito Maniac, Japanese Tales of the Macabre, and four short stories from this book got adapted into Junji Ito Maniac, and that would be Where the Sandman's Lives, uh, which they call The Sandman's Lair, Long Hair in the Attic, Unendurable Labyrinth, and Bullied. Those all got turned into Junji Ito Maniac episodes, and that's really, really cool that so many got pulled from this book. So, 12 stories, 4 got adapted, that's one third of this book turned into animation. That's cool as well. Uh, anyway, definitely would recommend it, but like I said, 
because this is earlier and experimental, it isn't exactly his best work. So I think it's good for more when you're a Junji Ito nerd and want to see his roots. Uh, not necessarily the best introduction to him. Obviously, conventional wisdom is if you're new to Junji Ito, you want to go with Yuzumaki, Shiver, or Fragments of Horror. Those are the best places to start. But once you know Junji Ito uh, and you're curious about his early stuff, this is a really good volume and I really love that they put it all in one place. A really interesting read. Uh, that being said, if you guys want to see me talk in more depth about this, I'm going to switch to the close-up camera and I'm going to show you guys the physical release of the book and then I'm going to do mini reviews for every single story in here which is why this video is so long, you know, a few minutes each story times 12, it, the video is going to get kind of long. But anyway, uh, without further ado, let's switch to the close-up camera. Alright, here we are inside the castle taking a closer look at Deserter from the Junji Ito Story Collection. I guess let's begin with bringing this closer to the camera and taking a look at the nice front cover. As I mentioned in some of my other reviews, these titles are different each time and they usually try to reflect uh, the story, what they mean. So Deserter is in this sketchy style and we can see that by the time we get to the R, it's very loose and very sketchy. The text is simply deserting us. Here we have the Junji Ito Story Collection badge. And if we pull out, we see the nice cover. Our characters down here, all shocked because there is a corpse above them. And Junji Ito, of course, is going into all the good gory detail of this corpse. Nice, creepy corpse face with all the rotting ooze in it. And always cool, you know, Junji Ito doesn't always work in color, but he obviously does for the front of these covers. And it's really nice to see the reds and the oranges and stuff like that. Uh, flip it to the side, Deserter, with the same text, but this time in black, the Junji Ito Story Collection badge, and below that, they always take a panel from the comic and use it as the spine image, and this is a group of Buddhist monks from the story Un Un Unendurable Labyrinth, so we'll get more on them in a little bit, and there's the Viz logo at the bottom flip it to the back and we get a nice close-up on that oozing corpse and we get the book's tagline an ever-increasing malice a mind-numbing tear see the seeds of horror sown in this collection of Junji Ito's earliest work and then a little description but yeah that's sort of the pitch for this volume is this is a collection of the early stuff and we get to see where Junji Ito was starting out, and we get to see him earlier on in his career and how he changed. Uh, the book is $22.99 US, uh, which being over 350 pages and in hardcover, yeah, that's a fair price. Although I will say, 350 page, I think the total page length is like 380 something so it's actually a little bit shorter than some of the other Junji Ito story collections that can go over 400 but not that much shorter but it is uh yeah a little bit shorter I think I think uh, but anyway rated T plus for older teens cuz yeah there are some a uh, good gory Junji Ito moments in here of uh, this signature viz media and if we crack it open we get the nice red in papers here and we will get um there's the corpse again front from uh the the comic panel and we get the title page here and we open it up and right across from the biohouse title page we get the table of contents again with a panel in blacker uh, color here so we have 12 stories and that's going to be biohouse Face Thief, Where the Sandman Lives, The Devil's Logic, The Long Hair in the Attic, Scripted Love, The Reanimator's Sword, A Father's Love, Unendurable Labyrinth, 
the village of the siren bullied and deserter so 12 stories and we're ending on the title story and one thing to note is these stories are of differing lengths so we see bio house goes from 3 to 27 so that's about 25 or so pages there but then we get like the devil's logic 83 to 93 so that's only about 10 pages but then a father's love 173 to 237 that's yeah about 60 so on average I think these stories tend to be about 30 pages long 30 35 something like that but we do get some shorter ones and some longer ones so that is interesting as well if we go to the back uh, I always like to take a look at the credit information uh, there is some interesting stuff here so deserter uh, originally Junji Ito Kishaku uh, not sure how to pronounce that number five so in the original Japanese order of these books this was the fifth one um, meanwhile for us it came out later I think this was number six actually if you don't count shiver I, this may have been number five for us as well um, it originally came out in 2011 and then if we pan down here first printing December 2021 and also noteworthy here third printing that's the one I got also from December 2021 yeah these things were selling like hotcakes if we can get to third printing within the first month that's that's pretty crazy uh, but anyway uh, we also get in the back that little Junji Ito biography where it talks about uh, who he is and uh, his work and inspiration stuff and him being a three-time Eisner Award winner so I do like the biography in the back uh, but anyway without further ado let's flip to the stories I'm going to do a bunch of little mini reviews for each story in here now that being said I won't be doing any major spoilers so I'll be avoiding the twist which sometimes does mean avoiding some of the crazy Junji Ito imagery but I really don't want to spoil anything for you um, but that being said without further ado let's get in to the stories alright starting out with bio house here we get this really fun kinda simple cover of her with the boss's neck and it's shooting out all this blood uh, relatively minimal especially for Ito but striking and gets the point across but anyway we get an opening that's uh, sort of quote out of this air here ah I want blood his blood that unparalleled flavor that fragrance I have to have it and the blood drips and actually divides the panel here the car going down the road and it turns out this lady is meeting with a potential employer uh, this guy here to talk about getting a really high profile job and he is so insanely rich he can just have people play violins in his front entryway all day long so yeah that's uh, that's pretty rich but it turns out she thinks she has an in you see they both share a passion for eating unusual things but even though it seems like she is telling the truth and she does like to do that it looks like the boss is going to be way more into this than she is and some of the stuff he brings out is going to gross even her out so yeah a nice little you know a familiar setting a job interview taken to this weird and extreme place that's still something we heard of but then it gets crazy uh, the boss leaves for a minute and comes back with a with a glass of what we would think would be wine but she quickly identifies it as blood but it's not just any blood you see it's the boss's blood and he's saying drink my blood and we get this really now drink you will drink it and she of course this is definitely a line for her and 
we get to see the beginning of the gore. It goes way farther than this. But he has several places open up on his neck where he's drained himself before, and he is going to literally be spewing blood And as he tries to get her to, to drink some of it. Now, like I said, this is uh, one of Junji Ito's earliest stories. I think the very first story he did that he actually completed was, uh, was Tomie, but if we look at this art, we can definitely see, like this panel of the boss, how how early this artwork is. So it is a little cruder, uh, but that being said, that is an interesting thing with this volume, is looking at Junji Ito's art and watching it get bigger and better and, yeah, just moving on. And I will also say, I won't spoil it, but this is one of those crazy uh, stories that gets crazier and crazier and bigger and bigger as far as you go. Like, from where I left you, don't worry, it gets much bigger than that. After that, we get a story called Face Thief, and we get this cover with a girl and a, a mirror and kind of fading into this other girl's face. And this story is about this new girl who comes to school and she sees some twins in the back of the room. The teacher's going to sit her up front, but one of the twins says, no, no, have her sit next to me. And for some reason, all the class is shocked by that. And this one girl, one of the twins, is going to start following her around, and she's not really a big fan. Our main character is kind of a loner girl and doesn't really want anyone tagging along with her. And this will eventually get her to be uh, violent, trying to get the other girl away. And this guy pushes her off and says, hey, you don't want to beat her up. You don't really know what she is. And you get her just kind of, even though she was being beat up, just kind of running off and not taking it too seriously. And he gives, of course, a vague warning that we don't really see come to fruition till later when she gets a look at her face and half of it is kind of changed. She's starting to look a little bit more like our main character now. I mean, the story is called Face Thief. I think we know where this is going. But it is really interesting, you know, the high school girl with the strange power keeping all the school hostage. And then what do you do to fight her? And what happens when you do? And I will say the ending of the story does get pretty fun. And again, this is Junji Ito. We can expect the strange Junji Ito visuals. After that, we get a story that was adapted into the anime Junji Ito Maniac. And this is Where the Sandman Lives. And I do love this cover where she's wrapped up in the tape and he's there at the bottom all tied up. But of course, how did we get to this scenario? Well, we open up inside a cafe. It turns out they're dating. He's a sort of mu a musician character and or a writer who's just into music, I'm sorry. And he says that his dream self is trying to take over, and she, of course, doesn't believe, and he starts to stomp out of there, but she eventually decides to come to his apartment to sort of watch him and keep an eye on him while he sleeps, and he, of course, will have a strange request. Roll the tape over to her and say, tie me up when I'm asleep so that he can't do anything. Well, when he's asleep, she of course thinks this is ridiculous and starts to cut him away. Yeah, it's always a great thing in horror movies to, uh, to deny the, the danger and take away the precaution. Well, she starts to read a book, she falls asleep, but when she wakes up, the other self is crawling out of his arm, literally I think they describe it as an inside-out hoodie, literally pulling out through his mouth to flip him inside out. That's crazy. You know, Junji Ito's known for these crazy visuals, and this is one of his earliest over-the-top visuals. I mean, 
the last couple did have some dark imagery and some... I mean, the ending of the last story had a pretty good Junji Ito visual, but this is, I think, one of his early classics as far as just deep, disturbing, messed up stuff. And yeah, this is you can see why this got chosen for the anime. A really interesting idea when you find out why the Sandman is doing this. It's a really interesting revelation as well. And overall, I really, really do like this story. Alright, after that we have a shorter one. And this one's entitled The Devil's Logic. And we get that the first page of this one is actually the first panel of the comic, which is pretty rare. Usually, Junji Ito covers our standalone, but uh, this one we get the teacher running up, saying, no, no, stay back, and a girl is going to jump off the school. Well, we flip to the next page and see that her friend is watching, and after she jumps, something flies out of her bag, and lands on the ground right next to him. And that's a tape recorder. But of course, why was there a tape recorder in the bag cut to just a few hours ago? They're talking, and it turns out he's talking about juicy gossip, and she might be setting up a date with someone, but she's being a little coy on the details, so that's why he slipped a tape recorder into her bag in order to see what she's talking about and he's listening in on that and we get a bit where she's talking and that's sort of what he kinda wanted to hear but someone else approaches shortly after it's uh, someone from one of their other classes they don't really know but really tall and keeping her face out and she says uh, sorry to come at you out of the blue but don't you feel like dying? And she starts to talk about the logic of wanting to die. And she starts to see her as a god of death, which I'm sure originally translated as a Shinigami. But, you know, not everyone's familiar with that word. So they just put god of death there. So apparently this girl committed suicide after a talk from this uh, kind of stranger from their school. So she said something that got her to kill herself, but what does that mean for the boy listening to this conversation in the present? Like I said, this is a shorter Junji Ito story, and it's definitely one of those cool ideas, go in, have a, a fun little adventure, but yeah, definitely couldn't get too many more pages out of it. But it is a fun idea, sort of, you know, twisted thing, you know, what's going on in this school, and sort of the idea being a, a speech that's kind of the enemy, a, a thought, a logic that's the enemy. There is a fun kind of little twist towards the end that isn't super important, but okay, adds a little bit to the story. Overall, short but sweet. After that, we get the story, long The Long Hair in the Attic. We see the younger sister looking in on her older sister in the attic and this is one that was adapted into the Junji Ito Maniac uh, anime here and if we flip it open we get to see um, we open up with the older sister and this guy they've been dating for a while but he says you know you're overly eager to please and you always agree with everything and I'm a little bit more of a free spirit. I want something a little wilder. And even though they've been together a long, long time, he's going to break up with her. And after that, we, of course, get the younger sister seeing her, not really knowing why she's so upset, and also mentioning that there's a rat in the ceiling, just to add a little bit more to that. But anyway, she's, of course, going to burn the picture and she has this flashback where she used to have really short hair but her boyfriend now ex-boyfriend was the one who said you would look really good with long hair you should grow it out so the hair was his idea and the hair is sort of a a symbol of their relationship now so now that that's over she still has this hair 
Well, it turns out she wakes up the next day and that rat from the ceiling has gotten caught in her hair and died while she was sleeping. Yeah, that's that's pretty gruesome. And yeah, after that, plus the boyfriend thing, you want to have your hair cut. So she's going to ask her little sister to cut her hair. She goes down to get the scissors. And while she's downstairs, the older sister screams. And this is when the story kicks up to 11. And her head is gone. So in that short time you are away from your sister, someone murdered her by cutting her head off and stole her head. That's pretty creepy. It's a really good, gory twist there that just comes out of nowhere and really, really gets you. But that being said, it does go farther. You know, this is going to have a, a whole third act that goes really, really good. A, a creepy Junji Ito twist that you wouldn't really get from too many other people as to, to what's really going on here. Because... You know, so far in the story, you haven't really got a clue as to the actual villain. You get the stuff with the relationship and the rats, but what's what's going on? And we'll eventually get to that creepy, creepy reveal. After that, we get the story Scripted Love, and we get to see Hem in the TV and her reading this book, which does very well describe something uh, towards the end of the story. Uh, you see, we get this girl and this guy, and I think uh, she's an actor and he's a writer, and he says, I'm going to leave you because I have to have more experience in life. I can't just be with one person. And he says, here's a tape to remember me by. Yeah, this guy's a great age jerk, a great age jerk right there. I'm breaking up with you. you. You can have a tape of me. Just, just watch this tape, and we get this appropriate panel. You're awful. Watch, yeah. And the girl, being so upset, decides to grab a knife and stab him to death. But of course, we get a flashback. Who are these people? How did we get here? And it turns out they're in a small drama crew, and she'll, of course, start dating the guy from earlier. And we get one of the friends trying to, uh, trying to warn her and saying, And listen, Corey, the sickest part is when he starts talking about a breakup. Apparently, he gives the girl a tape of himself. So, yeah, she gets plenty of warning, but... Overall, it seems like a good relationship, but we know, we know from the end of the story, but also from the countless warnings that uh, he's going to not be faithful, and that will eventually lead to what we saw earlier, but that's not just it. There is more of a twist to this tape and what it means and what it's trying to do, and why this doesn't have a gory Junji Ito crazy twisted body horror or anything, Junji Ito doesn't necessarily have to have that. He can work without his twisted body horror, and instead this is a, a twisted concept that I thought worked very, very well, and I thought was a pretty fun idea, and it definitely leaves me wondering about what happens to these characters after the camera stops rolling, but yeah... Definitely a really good Junji Ito, more on the psychological side, you know? Alright, after that, we have the Reanimator's Sword. And we get the cover there, with the main kid holding the sword, and the titular Reanimator behind him. And we crack this open. We get him and his best friend with a net how out hunting spirits. And they look up into the night sky and are actually lucky enough to see hundreds of them all flowing in this one direction. And of course, his friend is more apprehensive, saying, hey, isn't your grandfather at home dying? We should be out there. You should be with him. We shouldn't be doing this. What, what's even going on? And they find the spirits circling above this temple. 
and flowing into this one guy. Yeah, that's what's this weirdo doing? Well, we get this fun head turn as he sees the main character and starts to chase him away. And of course, he's going to have the titular sword there. So he chases him when the main character accidentally falls over a cliff, but he wakes up in his own bed with no memory of how he got there. So at least he's fine. But it turns out that over the course of these few days, the grandfather did die, and he was actually a pretty big-time politician, and they're keeping the death secret for a while when you see some of his other political friends have come to the door, and they've apparently hired the mysterious figure from earlier, the reanimator, and I think we can tell from the the title, he's the reanimator, so we, we kind of know what he's going to do. The kid looks in on him through a hole in the ceiling and sees him pull out the sword and he is going to stab the grandfather with the sword in order to bring him back to life. Some pretty cool effects of the life force going in to the grandfather through the sword and we're going to get a shot of the grandfather coming back to life. He's too big of an important politician. His friends aren't going to let him die. So they bring him back to do the political party's work for even longer. Yeah, that would explain a few things. Uh, but anyway, uh, so we get this sort of story about this reanimator with his sword and the kid's going to get sort of pulled into this world and find out you know, sort of the powers of the sword. And it is an interesting concept. It is an interesting haunted object. It's darker. It's still horror, but it's not as downright spooky horror as a lot of other Junji Ito stuff tends to be. A lot of his stuff tends to be pretty, pretty darn dark. And this isn't really along those tracks. And I won't spoil it, but from where this book ends off... It really does seem like it was a pitch for a series. It's much more standard. This is more along the lines of, say, Bleach than Junji Ito. And I think he was probably at this point in his career, because remember, this is his earlier work. I think he was probably looking to pitch this as a series. And, you know, even though this would have been long-term financial stability, I I'm kind of glad that this didn't turn into a series, because... We get Junji Ito, known for all these really great short horror stories, plus some of his longer ones like Tomie and Yuzumaki and stuff. But imagine if Junji Ito was only known for, like, 43 volumes of Reanimator's Sword or something, you know? I really am glad we got all these different, more creative short stories instead, and in that he wasn't, you know, like, like going into Bleach or Naruto, like a lot of other manga series that just run forever and just kind of get into battles and stuff. I really am glad that we got the Junji Ito we did instead, but it is kind of interesting, you know, to see this pitch. Anyway, after that, we get the story A Father's Love, and we get to see the daughter with the older brother and then the father kind of looming over them, and there's the family picture, and we get sort of a mystery this time around. We get the father, the mom, and the two sons and the daughter, and he starts to talk, and it says they were all happy, except for uh, they would all get headaches, you know, about once a week or so. All these kids would have terrible headaches. The older brother would uh, get in a fight with the family and then wind up killing himself. And then a little bit after that, there was a strange scene where the second brother's running down the street from the youngest daughter, and he kind of hides in one of his friend's house, and the daughter bursts in and says, hey, you're coming back home. So yeah, the daughter is acting really strange and evil, and you begin to wonder if it's going to be like a creepy daughter story or something like like Dissolving Classroom, maybe. Uh, but anyway, 
uh, she does take him back home eventually, and he starts to wonder, man, what was going on that night? And then we cut to a scene where the, the second son now is riding his unicycle by this busy, dangerous road, just kind of acting like a, like a crazy person. And he, of course, will take the unicycle and crash it. And then we get the strange line, Dummy, you went and fell. Okay, then. I'm sleepy. Sorry, buddy. I'm going to sleep now. You take the wheel. And then, of course, he will get run over by a car in a seeming accident. And the main character there is at the funeral with the daughter, who's now the only remaining offspring. And the father will start to talk about a family curse and how a lot of people in the family have died that way. And we'll also get another scene where the two of them are talking and she says she doesn't ever remember coming to his house. So what's going on? What's the truth? Why doesn't she remember that? Well, shortly after, the father comes and says, Hey, my daughter needs you to be her friend. I'll take a nap on this bench. You guys go and enjoy the fairground. And she's acting normal and happy and really glad to be around the guy. But then, of course, her attitude will start to shift. And we get this scene where she's on the Ferris wheel and she starts jumping around and trying to shake it and starts running amok. So what's going on? Is this daughter, you know, is she normal? Is she evil? And there's a bit of a mystery as to... Uh, what's going on with the family there, but I will say this is actually a longer Junji Ito story and you actually get to watch these characters grow up a bit and then when you find out what's going on you get to find out the dark and creepy motivation behind it and it really is kind of you know sad and and somber the the when you find out what's going on it's still dark and evil but you find out this sort of sick and sad reasoning and yeah it's a uh, just a messed up situation all around and a fun reveal and getting to know like i said this is longer getting to know these characters more it's more yeah again on the psychological side but with a good horror twist behind it so yeah that one was a really interesting story to kind of piece by piece unravel it all anyway moving on all right next we have unendurable labyrinth with this buddha statue the maze on the walls and our main girl here and we flip the page and it turns out the main girl has uh, abandoned going to school and her best friend is going to try to talk her into coming back over the course of this backpacking trip and the two will eventually get lost after they're lost for a bit they discover this shrine and there's a big buddha statue with something going on behind him a little passageway there and they meet the monks there's this really fun panel where they try to get the monks attention they just stare at them but they follow the monks back to where they came from and they get to see them training and stuff underneath the water lowering themselves down the cliff and they meet the leader and they start to talk about their new religion well he says it's too old to be called new but it's a sect of buddhism that is uh, relatively untalked about and they show him to the temple and the leader of course is going to try to work on the main girl saying you're not at peace I can help you find it and we get to find out more about her psychological issues and what's going on here and we also meet a third character a boy who um, his br older brother went missing and he thinks that he is somewhere in the temple so there is a bit of a mystery and I won't go too far into it but I will say that uh, there is a, the, the title of the story, Unendurable Labyrinth. They will eventually go back to that Buddha statue and there will actually be a labyrinth beneath it. So that is pretty cool. 
And overall, you know, you do get a pretty fun story here. What is the secret? What is going on deep down beneath this mountain? And, you know, it's always a fun story. Hey, there's a cult here. What exactly is going on? What are what is a strange group of people in the mountains? No one really knows who they are or what they're doing. Well, what are they up to? Anyway, after that, Village of the Siren, where we get this creature flapping around at the top. The siren, we follow the siren all the way down. And there's our main characters staring up at it. And this story begins with quite a scene, I'll tell you what. Um, we flip it open and there's a church and we get this guy forcing his way into the church and he says he's a reincarnation of a wizard that died long ago and he's going to go into the basement to free what the church has trapped in its basement and we also find out that this guy is running for mayor so yeah that's a lot to take in right there uh, but we get our main character who got a postcard from his mom which you know he used to live in the small town with his parents and he moved away to the big city and it turns out the dad abandoned the farm that they loved so much growing up to work in this new factory that the new mayor, the evil wizard, got to come to the town. Well, obviously it doesn't say evil wizard in the postcard, but anyway. Um, so what's going on with the parents? And on top of that, the news is talking about how there's a bunch of babies that have gone missing. So yeah, this is going to go dark. But anyway, he hears flapping sounds and thinks he sees his mother's face hovering outside his window. Very creepy Salem's Lot visual. So he's going to go back to his hometown, meet one of his old friends on the bus, and they're going to discover that a bunch of strange things are going on. The town is relatively empty. The field is all overgrown. The mother's being relatively non-responsive. And you kind of feel like you wandered into Silent Hill or something. And you get like one of the other friends. He bangs on her window. She doesn't hear or react. She's got a bunch of occult books on the ground. And when they meet her again later it turns out that she's actually deafened herself. She has put something in her ears so she can't hear, and she talks about how they all need to leave the town right now before the sirens start, and we get this beast flapping through the air, and we will, of course, get them following it back to the big siren coming out of the factory, this is a really good case of what the heck happened, why we were gone. And boy, I, I, I won't spoil it, but this story goes so freaking big. Like, even though there's only two stories after this, once I got to the end of that, I was like, ooh, that's a lot. I'm going to need to put my book down for a while and take a break because this story really, really does push it. There's such a big climax and such crazy Junji Ito visuals. And in this story, it's not the longest story in the book by any means. But yeah, um, Village of the Sirens. Okay, it's on the longer side. It's like 50 some odd pages. But boy, it feels like you've watched a movie by the end of this one, you know? It feels much longer. It feels like this could have been like a whole American comic book. And you get to the end and you're like, whoa, that was... that was intense. I'm gonna, I'm gonna need to process that. So overall, I really do like that. And I think even though it's just one Junji Ito story, and a, sadly, a lot of Junji Ito anime tends to rush things more than they should be, I want just that one story to be turned into its whole animated movie. This one's really good. Definitely, definitely would recommend it. Anyway, moving on. After that, we get the story Bullied. And we get to see her 
being the evil bully there and this little kid that she's picking on. But how did we get here? Well, uh, we flip to present day and there are these two adults hanging out in a park. And the woman says to her fiancé, I need to tell you this story before you marry me. And it's about this park. And she says, everything else has changed, but this park is a symbol of the past and it just won't go away and I wish someone would tear it down. And she explains the past here and we get to see that when she was a kid, she had a crush on the man that would become her fiance, but her uh, but the fiance's friends were kind of rude and pushed her away and made fun of her for having a crush. But she really liked the man that would become her fiance and was was trying to stick it out despite the fiance's jerk friends there. Anyway, one day this mother comes to the park with her kid and says, Look, my kid's new to the neighborhood. He doesn't know anyone. I'll give you a chocolate bar if you take care of the kid. So they start playing and they start becoming friends and the two start hanging out and the kid starts to repeatedly come up to her. So yeah, one day's pay of a chocolate bar turns into uh, having to hang out with this kid every single day and sadly having to hang out with the kid doesn't mean she can pursue her uh, the guy she likes, her crush. So it's sort of, you know, the kid doesn't mean to. The kid's just looking for a friend. But because he's just looking for a friend, uh, he's taking away this girl's opportunity to talk to her crush. So yeah, it starts to, to eat at her. And it's one of these awkward situations where she, you know, doesn't at first want to be rude to this kid, but... She needs to get the kid away from her, so she pulls this trick, I'm going to tell you a secret, and then yells in his ear, you know, her first act of bullying, and she starts to be really, really rude to this kid, you know, she starts to become the bully, where she's like, hey, you want a drink, don't go to the water fountain, go to the gutter here, and pushes his head in, and we get to see as she becomes more and more evil, Junji Ito starts to draw her more and more crazy looking. But yeah, I do like, you know, the story of this kid not meaning to be a bully, but becoming a bully, trying to push this kid away who's just not leaving for his own good. And, you know, I do like this story really had to be told from the present point of view, saying, look, there's something I remember from when I was a kid, and it's super bad and cringy, and I can't believe I did it. I think we all have a few memories like that. Hopefully not this bad, but yeah, when when you're a kid, your judgment is just not great. But I do like how this loops back around and ties into the present. And even though there's not Junji Ito monsters and insane body horror, there is a fun visual towards the end, and... This story is just such a good psychological story and talking about how human relationships can can get pretty darn messed up and it does have a really messed up ending. And yeah, if you're more on the drama side, definitely take a look at this story. I really did like it. Uh, this one I think also did get adapted into Maniac, so I haven't seen that one yet and I'm really looking forward to it. But after that, we get the story, the title story, Deserter, and we get to see them down there, and him looking at us at the camera, hiding in the upstairs room. And we find out there's this family on a farm, and every day afternoon, in the sort of at the beginning of night, this guy sneaks out of the upstairs storeroom and it comes to this family for dinner and it turns out he deserted the army in World War II so the story actually takes place in the uh, not too distant past and they start to talk but 
as they're talking, we can sort of hear the the inconsistencies. They start to talk about the war and Japan's still fighting it and Japan is actually invading America right now, which uh, if we're history buffs, uh, know that that didn't really happen. Uh, so they start to talk about an alternate history where Japan is winning the war and they've taken over a large part of the world already. We get these propaganda flags on the wall. And yeah, it's eight years or so after the war should have been over, but they're telling him it's still going on. A guy bangs at the door, and we get this guy, they say he comes around once a month, looking for the deserter, but after the deserter runs away, we see that they're sort of turning and calling up to make sure he hears their conversation. So we know that this is some sort of ruse. Uh, the military guy gets paid in food from the farm, but it turns out he was a former deserter too, and the military guy is trying to get revenge on him because he got caught and the other deserter didn't. So that's why he wants revenge. You know, he had to go to the front lines. But what about the other three? This one girl is super upset and doesn't want to do it anymore. But we find out why the brother is why the brother is wanting to do this. And it turns out that they blame the guy, the guy they have up in their storeroom for the death of the older sister. And that's where we get this flashback, you know, so what happened when they were hiding that led to the older sister's death? And we get a large chunk of the story going back in time. And there is going to be a really fun, really gruesome reveal that makes this feel like a fun episode of The Twilight Zone or something. You know, I actually have been thinking that recently, you know, like, I, I really wish a lot of Junji Ito stuff works really well in anthology. I really wish, like, Shudder's new Creep Show TV show, or maybe if they did a new Twilight Zone show, I think the CBS All Access one ended. But I would really love to see an anthology horror TV show pick up some of Ito's works, because... Yeah, this last one here could play as an interesting Twilight Zone episode. A really fun twist, a really fun backstory to add to the drama, and a good concept there. But anyway, overall, Deserter uh, is a pretty good book. Like I said, being a little shorter than 400 does make it on the shorter side of the Junji Ito story collections, but it's still got some really interesting stuff. Being a lot of Junji Ito's early works you do get to see him kind of finding his feet. You know, the cruder art in Biohouse, him essentially pitching in a more uh, standard story with Reanimator Sword, and we get to see that not all of them have that crazy over-the-top Junji Ito visuals, but some of them do, and you can see him finding his place in the world of body horror as well. But it's also interesting to see him not doing what he's known for, and going, okay, this is more of a drama story, we're going to treat it like this. And in turn, it is a little bit more unpredictable, and I really do like that. So overall, I definitely recommend it. Maybe not as your first Junji Ito book, because, you know, being early works, they're naturally not quite as strong. Obviously, go with traditional wisdom. If you're new to Junji Ito, use a Maki, Shiver, Fragments of Horror. But that being said, once you're familiar with him... It really is interesting to go back and see where he came from. I definitely would recommend this collection. If you guys want to hear me talk about more Junji Ito stories, I'll put a relevant playlist on the bottom. I think I have all the other ones of these covered. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, Tombs coming out later this month. But for now, I have a lot of Junji Ito books covered. I'm covering Junji Ito Maniac, the... Uh, the new anime that's out right now, and I've done things like unbox Junji Ito Pocket Curses, the Slug Girl Acryl Display, so if you want to see me talk about more Junji Ito, you can find more in this playlist at the bottom. Anyway, have a good day. I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Junji Ito Playlist on the bottom. Have a good day now.